<clears throat> You're listening to the Sands Pants Network. Home of comedy, <laughs> culture, <laughs> adventures, and ghosts. This is News Fighters. Where we fight the news so you don't have to. With Dylan Behan. Yes, hello everyone and welcome to episode 99 of News Fighters or as we'd say in Australia, 99. 99. And this week I'm looking at the brutal, sleepless, six week long slug fest that feels like it never ends. And no, I'm not talking about Elden Ring. I'm of course talking about... The election is called. Campaigning already underway. Six weeks for Australia to decide. And just listen to the enthusiasm in the voice of Channel 7's Mark Ferguson there, reflecting on... Let's be honest how we all feel about this election right now. Yeah, election time. And of course, the beginning of this election campaign means the beginning of a season of crap visual puns from board reporters at lame photo ops. And let's get the ball rolling with the first one this campaign. And it's from Seven's Mark Riley. Now, see if you can guess what he's going to say when Scott Morrison visited an aluminium can factory. I'll give you one guess. Scott Morrison. Morrison knows that for him, this election remains far from in the can. Wow, how did you come up with that stroke of genius, Mark Riley? That's that's your citizen cane of bad puns right there. Gee, saying in the can at a cannery. I guess that's why you broadcast journos all get paid the big bucks. Anyways, on to the official start of the campaign last Sunday, and immediately after visiting the Governor General's residence to call the election, which is very old-fashioned if you ask me. I'm amazed this government didn't waste $9 million just building an app so they could do that instead. But anyways, after that, Scott Morrison strolled out into the PM's courtyard at Parliament House and delivered what I reckon is the most low-energy and underwhelming speech begging to be re-elected I've ever heard. I love this country. And I love Australians. Yeah, not as much as some of your cabinet ministers, if you know what I mean. Some of them love multiple Australians at once, it turns out. Anyways, the premise of Morrison's whole re-election pitch basically boiled down to, yeah, I know I stuffed up, but uh, how about you give me another go? And I know Australians have been through a very tough time. Despite the very real difficulties that we face and the setbacks we indeed have had, our government is not perfect. We've never claimed to be, but we are up front. And you may see some flaws, but you can also see what we have achieved. This theme of it's not my fault all these disasters happened was also in his election commercial he released on the weekend. I mean, things are tough and they've been really tough. There's drought, there's floods, there's fire, there's pandemic, there is now war. This whole begging to be taken back, he's just stealing the whole pitch from uh, John Belushi when he tried to win back Carrie Fisher and the Blues Brothers. Remember that? It wasn't my fault. I ran out of gas. I had a flat tire. I I didn't have enough money for cab fare. My tux didn't come back from the cleaners. An old friend came in from out of town. Someone stole my car. There was an earthquake. A terrible flood. Locust. It wasn't my fault. I swear to God. Continuing on with the speech, Morrison then vaguely tried to defend his record as PM, starting with the economy. Unemployment was predicted to reach 15%, but now is it just 4% and falling? Sure, the unemployment numbers are low, but we all need two or three insecure jobs just to be able to cover our rent. According to Greg Jericho at The Guardian, more people are on Job Seeker now than before the pandemic, despite the low unemployment numbers, because people aren't making enough money at their multiple jobs to be out of poverty and are therefore still eligible for Job Seeker. And also, the only reason unemployment is low is because you shut the borders to migrant workers for the entire pandemic and are still keeping migrant numbers unnaturally low so you can keep unemployment low and win the election. But sure, unemployment numbers are low. Good job. And speaking of the pandemic, Morrison had the goal to try and run on his shoddy pandemic record. And our health response working together has saved, compared to other countries, tens of thousands of lives. Actually, mate, we saved our own lives by staying at home in lockdown for months we didn't have to because you didn't order enough vaccines. Oh, and by the way, now COVID is killing more people in car accidents and several types of cancer, but I don't see you funding any new hospitals or paramedics to deal with this huge increase in workload, and I don't see you trying to slow it down because you're trying to win the votes of Craig Kelly and Clive Palmer's freedom-screaming, conspiracy-theory-loving, right-wing nutjob supporters. Though, I have to say, at least Morrison understands one thing. And I get it. 
that people are tired of politics as we go into this election. <laughs> Mate, people aren't tired of politics. They're tired of you not taking responsibility for anything and forcing all of Australia into an every man for themselves Hunger Games type scenario every time there's a crisis. And we're sick of having a PM who uses the word plan more times than if he was on a treasure hunt, but then doesn't deliver anything. Our plan will deliver more and better jobs. Our plan does deliver tax relief. It's a plan that invests in roads and rail. And you can see our plan in an economic plan to plan our plan to plan and our plan to plan. People can have confidence in those plans because they're backed up by an economic plan. Yes, Mr. Plan has a plan all the time. But what the hell happened to all those plans? Last election, he was talking about commuter car parks and new change rooms. Where'd those plans go? Morrison, completely oblivious to reality, also tried to talk up his coalition team. It's a choice between a strong and tested government team. My strong and united team that I've led for these past three years, sitting around that cabinet table just in there. Yes, what a strong and united team you have there. Just so long as you forget about Christian Porter, Julie Bishop, Matthias Corman, Stephen Chobo, Christopher Pine, Malcolm Turbill, Greg Hunt, John Alexander, and everyone else who can't stand the side of you. Now that's a strong and united team. Yes, it's such a strong and united team that even Morrison doesn't know who's in it. Will Alan Tudge be in your cabinet if your government is returned then? Well, Alan, Alan Tudge is still in my cabinet. Fact check. He's not. He quit Cabinet in March. Morrison then tried to deflect by talking about his Labor opponents. It's a choice between a government that believes and has delivered lower taxes, because we believe you should keep more of what you earn, as we promised to do, and a Labor opposition that you know would always increase your taxes if given the opportunity. Yeah, look, I don't know if you've seen the state of the aged care or hospital systems lately, but uh, I think we need some new taxes to help take care of them. My mate's dad had a massive stroke recently. They couldn't get an ambulance. In the end, this was Morrison's most convincing argument for not electing Labor. It's a choice between a government you know and a Labor opposition that you don't. Now is not the time to risk that. So basically, ScoMo's entire re-election pitch is, look, things have been terrible under me. We're corrupt and incompetent, but I don't know about those Labor guys. Morrison's whole pitch, the whole Liberal Party slogan is basically, vote one Liberals. You know exactly how corrupt and incompetent we'll be. But anyways, this whole election's not just about Scott Morrison. Uh, like in the 2019 election, Labor is ahead in the polls. And Anthony Albanese is struggling to tell voters why they should pick him. We need a government that addresses the challenges of the present by anticipating and creating a better future, by having more secure work, by strengthening Medicare, by making sure we take up the opportunities that are there for dealing with climate change to create new jobs in new industries. We need to make sure we deal with the aged care crisis and we need to address cost of living uh, through measures like cheaper childcare and cheaper electricity prices. Oh dear God, Albo has focus grouped all his talking points down to the point where they're just a bunch of generic platitudes that everyone agrees with but isn't going to make anyone change their vote. You got to be specific, Albo. How how much cheaper will childcare be? How will it be paid for? How are you going to make jobs more secure without pissing off employers? And don't get me started on electricity prices. What the hell are you talking about? How are you going to make them lower? And what the hell does strengthening Medicare even mean? It's not a bloody butter sculpture melting in in the sun. And who's going to pay for the aged care funding? The billion dollar privately owned aged care providers? I don't think they'll like that. Seems Albo has put all his eggs in a basket of everyone being pissed off at Morrison, but instead of attacking him like Tony Abbott did in 2013, he just says vague things like, yeah, what if things are slightly better if you vote for me, but not too much better that, you know, I, we piss off the pensioners like we did last time. I don't, don't want things to be too much better. Anyways, with the lack of policy specifics to talk about at his daily press conferences, this week the journalist clearly just ran out of questions to ask Albanese and instead picked up the Saturday paper and started asking him the good weekend quiz. Anthony Albanese has fallen at the first hurdle today, unable to remember Australia's unemployment and interest rates. You mentioned the Reserve Bank earlier. Do you know the official cash rate off the top of your head? Oh, look, we, we can do the old, uh, old Q&A stuff over 50 but different... do you know it? Over, over 50, 50 different figures. It's up to people to ask whatever questions they want. Um, Andrew. What's the national unemployment rate? National unemployment rate at the moment uh, is, uh, I think it's 5.4, uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm not sure what it is. Yeah. Okay, look, first of all, no one can be expected to know everything all the time. That's why we always cheat on our phones when we're doing the Good Weekend quiz. But 
second of all, his unpreparedness was just a, a tragic show of complacency and arrogance from Albanese, who clearly thought he just had this election in the bag. What are you doing, mate? I'm a wacky clips podcast idiot, and even I know the cash rate is 0.1%. You know why? Because 0.1% interest is also the same amount of interest I have in this goddamn election right now. Anyways, it's no surprise that the media went in pretty hard on Albo after that. Do you concede that you've got less chance of winning the election today than two days ago? Can you understand the criticism that you may have lost all credibility on these issues now? Can you promise Australians that you are across the data of the economy, or are you out of your depth? Albo on day one choked. Despite being the bookie's favourite, the media's favourite, and the Twitter god, he stuffed up huge. Yeah, Sky News is Paul Murray at the end there being brutally hard against Albo for not knowing uh, some cost of living basics. Uh, let's see how hard Paul Murray was against uh, Prime Minister Morrison back in March when he didn't know the cost of a loaf of bread. Prime Minister, nice to see you again. Good to see you, Paul. Now, before we get into everything, I've got a selection of breads here. I need you to rank them from most expensive to least expensive. Um, yeah, we, we might do that a bit later. Sure. Um, sure, sure. We'll make some toast. Yeah. Good to see Sky News holding Morrison to account as always. Anyways, next day, Albanese did the most prime ministerial thing he could think of and spoon-fed the media a stupid pop culture reference. Here's a Taylor Swift comment for you. My theory is, shake it off. Ugh, yet another example of Labor copying all the worst aspects of the Morrison government. And, and you should shake it off. It takes a long time to shake off. To shake it off. Now the Labor Party might want to shake that off. But it turns out Albanese's gaffe wasn't the only colour on the campaign trail this week, as countless colourful constituents came out to greet our Prime Minister at the pub. In a Newcastle pub last night, the Prime Minister was abused by a disability pensioner. Hey, I'm paying a death tax every week. Scott Morrison patient in the face of former miner, Ray. Hey, you better do something. I don't care. I'm sick of your bull. Another woman seeking a selfie also made her feelings well known. Congratulations on being the worst Prime Minister we've ever had. A screaming protester who confronted Scott Morrison at a pub in Western Sydney last night. Across the river here, across the Japan River, people lost their houses, people lost their houses, and they were burnt. You're a disgrace! Yes, in just three short years, Scott Morrison has gone from the guy you want to shout a beer with at the pub to the guy you just want to shout loudly at at the pub. So if you're looking at all these reactions in the last three years and thinking, well, there's no way Scott Morrison can win again. Well, seems there's two groups of people you're forgetting about. Firstly, Liberal voters who somehow think Scott Morrison's done a good job. I think the country's at, at, at risk at the moment and I think it'd be in safer hands if it was a Liberal government. I've made some mistakes. But the other people are a bit unknown. Well, I've always been a Liberal and I'll follow it because I really like what they do. Yep. They've got our country up and, well, we're all eating. I think it's that ScoMo's done a good job. Yes, vote Scott Morrison, she says, because we're all eating. Well, a uh, fact check. Turns out people are using food banks in record numbers. More than a million children went hungry last year and one in six adults experienced food insecurity. But hey, you and your friends are eating and that's all that matters. And then you've got the other group you've probably forgotten about who'll help get Morrison across the line, the people who don't pay any attention to politics and will probably vote for whoever the incumbent is. A bit over politics, really. I sort of switched off a while ago. I don't know. I don't know who the other man is that we might be voting for, apart from Scott Moe. Yes, that's right. She only knows Scott Moe. Close enough. But look, at the end of the day, the coalition thinks they'll win because, as Barnaby Joyce pointed out... This is not a popularity contest. Yes, which explains why someone like Barnaby Joyce can succeed in politics, but in any other job would be fired in the first two weeks. Anyway, Scott Morrison tried to own Barnaby's astute observation, but wound up kicking a bit of an own goal here. Well, you know, it's not a popularity test. Barnaby said this the other day. You go to the dentist, doesn't matter whether you like him or not, or like her or not, but you want to know that they're good at their job. Oh my God, he, he lacks complete self-awareness at exactly how shit he is. But look, funnily enough, I think that dentist analogy is actually scarily accurate when it comes to politics. First of all, who can ever be bothered changing dentists? Uh, it's too much work to do the research. Second of all, uh, who knows if their dentist is any good at their job anyway? We've never had enough dentists to really be able to tell. And three, we generally keep going to the same dentist that our parents introduced us to. Oh, he, he seems like a nice guy. I'll just stick with him. Anyways, look, on a personal note, I've been covering federal elections since 2004 and... 
This election kind of feels like 2004 again. Back then, Labor started in front. Everyone was sick of John Howard. He was old and stale and a liar. And everyone, I mean, everyone hated his guts. But at the end of the day, these people... A bit over politics, really. I sort of switched off a while ago. I don't know who the other man is that we might be voting for. Just couldn't be bothered changing dentists. All right, everyone, that's episode 99 of News Fighters. Thanks for listening. A bit of an update on what's happening during the election campaign. I'm going to be going at least weekly. So uh, stay tuned. I'm also going to try and do quick turnaround episodes after the big events like the debates and the campaign launches. And for those of you who are excited about what we're doing for episode 100, well, due to COVID cases being out of control, I've ruled out doing an in-person stage show, but I am going to release a very special celebrity cameo filled uh, best of celebration episode now i'm going to release that on our patreon uh, next week for all our patreon supporters uh and then um because i don't want to disturb the flow of the election and i'll probably need a break when the election's over i'm going to release it on the free feed uh and on the youtube after the election so if you want it early sign up to our patreon at patreon.com slash newsfighters or if you want to support the show in another way you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash newsfighters or sign up as a supporter on apple podcasts uh, by clicking a bonus episode don't forget uh, to follow and subscribe to the show on your podcasting app of choice or hit subscribe on youtube and newsfighters as always is, is written produced and edited by me dylan bain for sans pants radio we also have a free newsletter at news fighters.com all these links are in the show notes and uh happy 2022 election everyone don't go kissing too many babies keep fighting and bye for now this is news fighters where we fight the news so you don't have to apart from scott my <laughs> <laughs>